I'ma let the Holy Spirit talk for me My words ain't of myself, lean on my Father for help I meditate and let the Spirit talk to me I lift my eyes to the hills from which come with my help So I can let the Holy Spirit talk for me My words ain't of myself, lean on my Father for help I meditate and let the Spirit talk to me I lift my eyes to the hills from which come with my help So I can let the lean Holy on Spirit talk for me God is that protection If the Spirit tell me do it, I don't even have the question Working on my flaws, so I'm striving for perfection Never get tired of putting my brick in for the kingdom I'm restless, gotta be led by the Spirit to avoid the misdirection I'm grateful for my wisdom and that he used me as a vessel Don't let your disdain for the messenger make you miss the message Try the Spirit by the Spirit, yeah that's how you gotta test it The heart is deceitful and wicked, nobody can know it So you can't even trust yourself, you gotta lean on the Lord Don't get so puffed up with pride that you can't learn no more And the Spirit stop speaking to you when your prayers get ignored So many people judge matters based off how they feel Without righteous judgment, they just wanna condemn You gotta hear the whole matter before you answer, man That's why the Spirit talk for me, don't wanna be like this I'ma the Holy Spirit talk for me My words ain't of myself, lean on my Father for help I meditate and let the Spirit talk to me I lift my eyes to the hills from which come with my help So I can let the Holy Spirit talk for me My words ain't of myself, lean on my Father for help I meditate and let the Spirit talk to me I lift my eyes to the hills from which come with my help So I can let the Holy Spirit talk for me Shalom, Shalom, Mark Shalom, family uh, Shalom so just want to start off by giving all praises, honor, and glory to the Most High God, whose name is Yahweh, in the name of his only begotten son, whose name is Yahweh Shai, who's popularly known all around the world as Jesus Christ. And um, tonight, my brother, my op, Aaron, got a presentation of a lesson that he's going to bring, and I'll let him give you the uh, title. And brother, if you want to say anything, you can. Kind of, kind of absolutely. Um, yeah, the, the water for the for the introduction um <clears throat> and first and foremost i'll start by giving all praises honor and glory to the most high whose name is yahweh and the name of his son is their beloved son i'll i'll give praise in that name and his name is yahweh Shah. and um yeah the name of the lesson for tonight will be a part two of a previous lesson i did from uh i think like two weeks ago and it's going to be called, Is Jesus the Son of God or the Father himself? Right? So, um, yeah, again, like I said, this will be a part two. Um, I'll be touching on a few more, um, I guess we could say, misinterpreted passages that people utilize to claim that the Most High or, or the Son is the Father. And... Um, and I'll and I'll also touch on a few a few proofs proofs that um that show that he is the son of God the Father and not the Father himself, right? But uh, if you got anything you want to um add in, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Nah, nah. Uh, just uh, everybody that's tuned in, if you are tuned in right now, if you could please go ahead and hit a like on the video and also share. You can also use the at highlight feature or just tag some brothers and sisters that you know that may want to hear this edification. And um, anybody that's listening on the replay, we ask that you do the same thing. But uh, all praises, brother, you got it. Kind, kind and also, yeah, just like how the brother spoke to, you know, make, make sure to like the video, make sure to share it, make sure to comment, you know, so that we know you're on the stream. You know, also utilize the at highlight feature if it works for your account. Um, also add followers as a brother said as well so um <clears throat> uh, without anything further we can get on started and again the name of the presentation will be um part two of is jesus the son of god the father or the father himself right and um again just to make my stance clear and really the biblical stance um we we know that the Bible teaches that uh, Jesus is the son and he has a father. All right. So first, we're going to start off with um, what the Apostle Peter said. All right. So let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. And we're going to 
start with uh, verse 13, if you can. Kai, this is Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Kai, so the Messiah is posing a question and, and asking, Who do men say that I am? Right. He's speaking to the disciples, you know, so in this particular moment, he's going to give the space for his disciples to, to speak to this question. Right. So you could read uh, verses 14 on down to 15. Okay. And they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias and others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Con. So some of them answered, you know, what, what some of the surrounding beliefs were, you know, of the people at that time, right? You know, some of those guesses included John the Baptist, you know, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But Yahweh he responds and says, well, who do y'all specifically say that I am? Right? You know, he wants his disciples to give their answer to the question not just you know what people are saying right so if you can just jump down to verse 16. Con. this is matthew 16 and verse 16 and simon peter answered and said thou art the christ the son of the living god Con. <clears throat> and and real quick I'll, I'll pause for a second but i would I would like to ask somebody that uh that that believes that Jesus is the uh, the Father. I would want to know, um, you know, would they debate Peter? You know, because he he said, "Thou art the Christ, the Son of the Living God." You know, he he didn't call him the Father, right? But um, you know, as we can see based on the text, you know, Peter he answered and said that Yahweh was the Christ or the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. You know, so with that being said, because he, he answered it cleanly, let's see what the Messiah responds. Now you can jump down to verse 17. Con. This is verse 17. It says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, to him, Blessed art thou, Simon, Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. Con. So the Messiah. <clears throat> He says that Peter was blessed, you know, and that flesh and blood hadn't revealed this to him, you know, but his father in heaven. So, again, you know, this is a proof that Yahweh or Jesus isn't the father, but he has a father and um, he's uh, the Messiah. Right. But secondly, Yahweh he told Peter that he was blessed uh, uh, from his father. You know, or, or blessed because his father, you know, revealed this truth of him being his son. All right. So after Peter, you know, you know, a answered in the way he did, you know, the Messiah, he goes on to say something very crucial and important. Right. So you could jump down to verse 18. And you can read that. Come on. This is Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. And I say also unto thee. That thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Con, con. So <clears throat> the Messiah, you know, he, he continues on and he says to Peter that upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And something I'll touch on just briefly is that, you know, you have many arguments for the interpretation of this particular passage, you know, because some people, they say, you know, this is the Messiah saying that Peter is the rock, you know, you know, because of his confession of faith. Right. And, you know, and, and people, they believe this because, you know, Peter's name, it means a stone. And, you know, many people, they'll interchange the word rock and stone. But the meaning for these words, when you look at them, um, they're actually similar, but there is a distinction and difference, you know, because 
Peter, when you when you look at the interlinear and you jump through the Strong's numbers, Peter is actually the word uh, Petras, which means a stone when you click on it, right? You know, or a fragment of a rock. Oops, it's a lot, y'all. Nah, but um, you know, it, it means a, a stone or a fragment of a rock, right? And when you look at deeper, right, a, a piece of a rock, you get what I'm saying? So, you know, with, with that being said, you look at the word rock, and there's a clear distinction. It's the word uh, petra, which means a rock or a large stone. When you look at the Greek language. Um, and you see right here at the definition, it'll tell you that that exact thing, right? A rock or a large stone. So, you know, with, with that being said, when you compare these two, you'll find that, you know, uh, th these are two completely different words, or it's like a two two words with you know some distinction, some similarities, but these don't mean the same thing, right? So, again, just moving forward a little bit. You know, we see that the Messiah, he does name Peter the word for stone, right? And he names him this because he confessed the truth about the Son of the Most High, right? And as we read through um, throughout the Bible, we'll see that the Son is the rock, you know, which, again, this is speaking to him being the foundation, right? And and so that, you know, and, and you know, so with that, we see that. You know, the Messiah, he's that foundation and that and that truth that the church would be built on. Right. And just to kind of prove that throughout the scriptures, um, let's jump to the book of First uh, Corinthians, the third chapter. Uh, all right. First Corinthians, uh, first Corinthians, chapter three. You know, you can read verse nine through eleven. Uh, this is first Corinthians, chapter three, verses nine through eleven. For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that that is laid, Salaki, than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. God. So no other foundation can be laid than that of the Messiah. And and when you keep in mind, you know, the language of being, you know, you know, used, you know, like, you know, which is dealing with like building, you know, off of rocks and large stones and things like that. Um, when, you know, when you deal with the concept of foundations being laid, you know, this is dealing with um, the concept of, you know, something that's. Uh, uh, you know, very superior in strength, right? Because when you go back to that that passage in Matthew 16, it makes mention that, you know, there's not going to be anything that can prevail against this foundation, right? And so with that being said, you know, just to kind of deal with, you know, the Messiah being that, um, you know, that that uh, that cornerstone, you know, so to speak, or that or that large stone that, you know that the uh, that the church is built off of. We'll see that the prophets and the apostles. You know they they're the foundation that's built upon the Messiah, right? Let's go to the book of Ephesians, chapter two, verse nineteen on down to twenty. God, this is Ephesians chapter two, verse nineteen and twenty. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Mm. So right here we see that the apostle Paul, you know, he speaks on the foreigners, you know, who have been reconciled back to their people and their God. And he says they're of the household of God, which is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, you know, which of course would include Moses, Isaiah, Peter, John, you know, and etc. Obviously, you know, but then it says that Yahweh Shai himself is the chief cornerstone. And when you go into you know the verbiage, you know, that says, you know, chief corner, 
it's actually dealing with a large stone, you know, that holds up a structure, you know, because it's placed in an extreme corner, right? And when you look at the Greek language right there, it literally touches on that. It'll it'll go into it um explicitly, right? But this is again, this is just an, an amazing link, you know, because you know the, the Bible it you know it's it's a beautiful book, right? Because it just it explains itself when you just actually read it. You know, you read, you know, the prophets because the prophets they speak about these things, you know, throughout Isaiah, you know, Deuteronomy and things like that. But even the apostles, they bear witness, you know, to what the prophets and, and the law said, right? But when you look at the definition and even the usage, you know, it speaks to this, you know, where it says placed at an extreme corner, you know, the corner foundation stone, etc. Right. You know, so again, you know, we see that the Messiah, he's that that chief cornerstone, and what's built upon him, you know, are are the the prophets and the words of the apostles, you know, who confess, you know, the truth about the Son, right? You know, so with that being said, unless you got any points, we can jump back to Matthew 16. Time, time. Matthew 16. God, you could um yeah, you could just read 18 one more time. Time. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Kind. So, so in short, um, you know, we we find out that the apostle Peter he confesses that Yahweh Shai is the, the Christ or the Messiah, or you know, or the anointed, you know, and he's the son of the living God. And based upon this truth right you know based upon this information this confession you know of who yahweh Shah truly is you know this is what you know the the, the fundamental tenet and in, in, in fact that the church is going to be based upon right and then the rest of the confession you know which comes from the prophets and the apostles you know is is the further foundation right but again something important like this shouldn't you know shouldn't go unnoticed right because we don't see peter say you know you are the most high or you are the father and we don't see Yahweh should i say yeah brother you're you know you're blessed but we see him say that peter is blessed for admitting that he's the son right you know so you know i i, I believe we can um, we can move on to another point right uh, and I'm gonna make this one point that uh mm -hmm. the the doctrine of um when people read this description they say that Peter was the rock mm -hmm. um it actually stemmed from the Catholic Church and that's why you um have the Saint Peter and all that and they they pretty much exalt Peter as if he's the rock because that's their mm -hmm. interpretation of these scriptures is that Yahweh or Jesus who they know as Jesus was basically anointing him as the rock that right. he's going to build his church on right kind yeah like that's and and again like I, i'm sure you know a, a a good amount of brothers and sisters they never they never really like took that deep dive into it and they you know they kind of ran with that that dogma but you know like once you actually take a look into this you know and you look at what the precepts say throughout the scriptures you know then this is actually a beautiful saying but uh, we can continue on and we can go to Philippians 2 and 6, right? Um, you know, because this is one of the places that people often use to teach that Yahweh Shah is the father, right? But, you know, we're going to give the correct understanding. So uh, if you could just read Philippians 2 and 6. Con, this is Philippians 2, verse 6. Who, being in the form of God, Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Okay. So people will use this passage to say that Jesus Christ, who um they'll they'll be like, you know, Jesus Christ, who was in the form of God, he didn't think it was robbery to be equal with God. So therefore, he's the father, you know, or you know, in a Trinitarian's case, 
um, you know, he he's co-equal with the Most High, or he was co-equal with the Most High, right? But let's actually explain what's what's truly going on in this passage. What you know, the Apostle Paul is actually saying. Um, if you can, can you jump up to verse four? God, let not every man. Salaki, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Con, con. You know, so he said, look not every man on his own things, but also the things of others. And and basically what what's being said right here is um, you know, don't don't just worry about your concerns, but bear others' burdens. Or, or others concerns as well right and that's why you know the apostle peter he said in a different epistle you know bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of christ roughly paraphrase right but let's let's continue down you can read verse five let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus Con. so he continues on and he says let this mind be in us which was in yahweh meaning let's have this mindset that the messiah had and notice the colon right here you know this is very important that the translators place this right here because they understand based upon syntax and the greek the greek text itself that the apostle paul is about to to uh to list or there's a list that's about to precede this this um this phrase right so you can continue on to verse six Ah. who being in the form of god thought it not robbery to be equal with god Con. so you know i'm i'm sure you know we can see that contextually um the understanding that paul is you know saying you know the messiah thought it you know it or, or thought it not robbery to be equal with the most high um i'm sure that we could see that you know, this understanding is unintelligible because, you know, Paul, he literally just said to have this same mindset, you know, and, and I, I know and I would hope that many people that believe that Jesus is the father, you know, I hope that they wouldn't think that Paul was, you know, would, would, would tell us to, you know, think it wasn't robbery to be equal with the most high, you know, based on, you know, uh, you know what's being said right here because that would be a, a very dangerous doctrine right and and the brother hurdy can attest to it you know there are people that are kind of walk you know walking around and and and, and saying that you know, they're saying yeah you know i'm equal with the most high you know i'm one with the father you know you know the father is me you know all of these things but i, I was just sitting here saying to myself that this must be where they got this misunderstanding from God. Uh, you know and and again like if 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 that would like if paul was literally saying you know what people accuse him of saying you know when they try to use this to say that jesus is the father or the most high then you couldn't get mad at someone trying to say that like you, you literally couldn't get mad at someone trying to say that right but again let, let's look at you know the actual greek text right you know because this phrase you know who being in the form of god thought it not robbery to be equal with god let's look at this word for not right um believe is this word right here uh, which is ooh, g3756 let's go into it right because this is very important and I want y'all to see this. Um, you see the root word etymology. Um, if you look at uh, the outline of biblical usage, it says no, not in direct questions, expecting an affir um, affirmative answer. Um, the definition is very telling because it says um, the absolute negative, right? And then it says no or not, um, nay, neither never etc right so you know we, we see that 
right here, the Apostle Paul, he's impl implying or implementing an absolute negative. So this is that like a definite no. So the Messiah thought it not. Now, what, what did he think it not? Let's look at this word robbery, right? Let's take a look at it. And um, and I, if you could, could you could you read this for me? God. The act of seizing robbery, a thing seized or to be seized. Booty to deem anything a prize, a thing to be seized upon or to be held fast, retained. And Strong's definitions, plunder, properly concrete, robbery. Con, con, so, or pop. you know, con, yeah, the, and, and this word, um, G726, is the word, um, arpagmos, arpagmos, salakia. And, um, <clears throat> you know, when we, again, like how the brother read, when we look at the lexicon, it means a thing seized or to be seized or to deem something a prize. You know, so when we take what the Greek language says into account, you know, we see that the, this is saying that the Messiah by no means seized equality with the Most High. That's that's the sense of what's being said right here. And you, you kind of see that reflected in different translations outside of the KJV. All right, so let me... um. I didn't plan on going into any different versions, but let's just, we could take a look at it. Um, in LT, it says, though he was God. And of course, this whole God, like I know that the brother heard he went into the usage of God. He broke it down beautifully, but the word God, this can be applied to many other people. So like, it's not an issue with the Messiah being called God or anything like that, because the Bible says he was God. But was he God the Father or, you know, the Most High, you know, the God of himself? Of course not, right? Well, when you look at the NLT, it says he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to, right? That's the NLT. Um, uh, NIV says um, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Like all, like all of these things or all of these translations they they speak to this point and they show that the the messiah he didn't um like think it was a good thing to consider himself equal with the most high so with that being said why would anybody teach contrary to that you know why would you teach that yeah he's equal to the most high when literally he he thought it he he thought it wasn't something to be seized to do, you know, to do, right? Or he, he didn't, you know, deem that something prize worthy, right? He didn't try to do that. But let's read what he did. You can read verse seven through eight. Time. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man, of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. God. So the Messiah, um, you know, by no means seized, you know, being equal with the Most High. You know, he didn't deem that a prize. But he made himself of no reputation and took on the form of a servant. You know, and then in verse 8, um, he became obedient unto death. Right. And we see these things prophesied throughout the prophets. You know, you see it in Isaiah, you know, most notably Isaiah 53 uh, touches on, you know, the suffering servant. Right. You know, but we even see this throughout the Gospels, you know. But the point here within Philippians 2 is that, um, you know, Yahweh actually did the opposite of make himself or, or he did the opposite of making himself equal. To the most high right and the apostle paul you know he he teaches this you know and we see this within the gospels he's constantly you know saying that he came from his father and things like that you know so we see that he made himself with no reputation you know like he didn't try to say oh well like do you know who i am like 
Like I'm I'm Yahweh the Father. Like he he didn't come down and say that. You know, but um you got any points out before I move nah, on? Nah, that's that's beautiful uh explanation of that passage because it, it definitely gets uh it gets confused and it gets understood in in an improper way where people do look at Christ as the Father. So it's a beautiful breakdown. I, uh, all praise is to what uh, but um next passage is gonna be um John 8 58 because this one um you know this gets utilized to say that uh like they'll read it and they'll say well well look Jesus said you know he's the I am right but you know I I'll let the brother read it first and then I'll kind of give the uh, the Rogerian argument, if you will. Come. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Come. So, you know, as I said, you know, uh, people, they'll pull out this passage or, or they'll loosely quote it and, you know, they'll say, well, Jesus is the I am, um, you know, and, and only the father was that, you know, only the father was the I am. He, he spoke to Moses in that bush. Right. But, you know, there's there are many issues with this position, you know, because, you know, with this particular understanding, um, you know, we'll, you know, just throughout the text, you know, as we go a little bit uh, higher in the chapter, you know, we'll see that 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 doesn't um walk congruently with the rest of the bible you know so let's let's prove that let's jump up to john 8 and 51 you know you can read all the way down to 53. kind verily verily i say unto you if a man keep my saying he shall never see death then said the jews unto him now we know that thou hast the devil abraham is dead and the prophets and thou says if a man keep my saying he shall never taste of death art thou greater than our father abraham which is dead and the prophets are dead whom makest thou thyself so like whom makest thou thyself okay so yahweh said if you keep his sayings you won't taste death and the jews you know, they they thought that he had a, a demon on him or a devil on him. And so they they asked him, you know, and you know, in return, um, was he greater than Abraham, you know, as well as the other prophets, right? So this is the narrative that's happening. So let's continue on. You could jump down to verse 54. We're gonna get to the point soon. Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father that honoreth me, mm. of whom ye say that he is your God. That's another one right there. He literally identifies that he has a father, right? But um, he said his own honor towards himself basically means nothing. But his father honoring him is what's important. And again, this is jesus or yahweh Shai admitting that he has a father just straight up cleanly right but uh you could jump down to verse 55 to 56. God. yet ye have not known him but i know him and if i should say i know him not i shall be a like liar like unto you <laughs> but i know him and keep his saying your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Come, oh, man. He's a, the Lord he be, was cold. He be, he be talking reckless. For real. <laughs> For real, man. He, he said, I shall be a liar like unto you. Come. <laughs> oh, man. But, um, you know, right here we, we see that the Messiah, he said they, they didn't know his father. Again, um. You know, he, he's just continuing on to, to to harp on the point that he has a father, right? But he said they didn't know his father, you know, but he knows his father. 
And he also says that Abraham, you know, he rejoiced to see his day and saw it and was glad. And and when he says this, he's making reference to the fact that the Most High made a promise to Abraham, you know, and, you know, Abraham, he had the spirit, you know, to believe in those promises and the fulfillment through Yahweh Shai, you know, and he was, he was even glad, you know, to, to, uh, to be able to see these things, you know, prophetically speaking, right? You know, even though he didn't get to, you know, he's not going to be able to, um, you know, see, like to physically see like what, what came about, you know, with Jacob and then his 12 sons and all of those things. Like he didn't, he didn't get to see, um, you know, at, like everything that transpired, right? But, you know, Abraham, he had the faith. Right. And that's what people that's what they know Abraham for. You know, they'll say the father of faith and they don't they don't fully get the concept of faith. And that's that's definitely a lesson that, you know, that we can touch back on again, you know, like the like the true biblical concept of faith. Right. But um, but real quick, let's go to Hebrews 11. You know, because speaking of faith, they call this the hall of faith. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, <there's> one. <laughs> You you could uh, start at verse you, you just, uh, we get down to the point um eight, uh, eight through thirteen. Come by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which have foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I'm going to continue. Khan, you can read down to 13. Salak, yeah, if I didn't call the, the last verse. Khan. Through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead. So many as, as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand, which is by the seashore innumerable. Mm. These all died in faith, not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Con. That's a powerful text right there. Uh -huh. But um, right here we see that, you know, it makes mention of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right, within verses 8 and 9. And it said that they were heirs of the same promise. Right. And that promise that it's referring to is, you know, the one that the most high made to Abraham, you know, when, when it said that, you know, in his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And and that also, you know, his his seed would 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 uh, be innumerable, you know, on the earth. You know, he the most high, he says this to not only Abraham, but he says it to Isaac and then he says it to Jacob. Right. And it, it speaks to the fact that this was passed down, right? But, you know, it also mentions Sarah and her conceiving seed, you know, even though she was past age, right? And then when we jump all the way down to verse 13, you know, it, it said all of these people, you know, and, and this is referring to all of the people that were mentioned in the prior verses, you know, before verse 13, it said that they died not receiving the promises, but they seen the promises afar off, you know, and they were persuaded of them and they embraced them. And of course, this would include the prophet Abraham, right? So this is what Yahweh Shai is speaking to when he says that Abraham rejoiced to see his day and was glad, you know, because Abraham, he seen the promises. You know, he, he was, he believed the Most High, but the Most High actually showed him, right? And he he embraced the words of the Lord, right? And that's and really that's more so why 
Um, that's 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 true faith, right? But I just, I want to make this quick point since I touched on true faith. In verse eight, it said, "By faith, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed." Right. So, faith is you know when you're truly persuaded, it's gonna cause you to obey the word that you were given. Like no one's not like no one's just gonna have faith and not do nothing. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, so if you, you know, like if you believe in the most high, you're going to actually obey his instructions. You're not just going to say, oh, oh, I'm, I'm believing God, but you, you know, doing everything against, you know, what he said in his instructions. Right. But that's, that's just a side note. I, I just, I, I thought about it as you were reading it. Right. But uh, we could jump back to verse, um, I'm sorry, John 8. Con, and yes. I'm going to make a point. Con. Um, like, uh, we can look at it from the standpoint of us today. Um, we don't know if we actually going to see the kingdom be ushered in, like, or we're going to die before it happens. Um, but we see the evidence of the things that have been promised to us. We see Babylon falling. We see our people waking up and coming into this truth. We also see people falling away from the truth. All these things were prophesied. So it should actually increase our faith and strengthen us and, you know, helping us know that what he said he going to do, he going to do. Okay, beautiful point. Time. 100% agree. Um. Can you read uh, verse 57 through uh, 58? Kind, kind. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Kind. So after he said, you know, what he said about Abraham, you know, they responded and said, you know, that he wasn't even 50 years old. Right. But somehow he's seen Abraham. Mm-hmm. So like they're they're taking it, it like from how it appears, they're taking it as if he's, you know, he's saying, uh, yeah, like, you know, Abraham seen my day. And now, you know, he's claiming to be, you know, from uh, from this time, about 2000 years, like however he would be. Right. God. But they're like, man, you're not even 50. <laughs> and so it, it just it kind of shows you, you know, how, how simple Jake can be. God. You know, I, I kind of I kind of picked it up as as you was reading it, right? But yeah, how was I he responded to him and, and he said, Before Abraham was, I am. You know, and and this phrase, you know, like I said earlier, you know, is you know, it gets taken to be a, a, a direct reference to um you know when you know when the most high uh you know spoke to Moses in the burning bush but you know just one quick thing right when you look in the book of Exodus the third chapter and we can touch on it just a tad bit right you'll see that you know although the most high he's given a message to Moses, this isn't literally the most high in the bush. So, um, and I, I wasn't initially going to go into this, but I feel like it is necessary since I'm making mention of it. Um, if you can, can you read Exodus chapter three and you can read from one uh, verse one on down to two? Kind. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father in the law. Salaki, father-in-law, the priest of Midian. Now he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. Okay. So right here, it, it makes it clear that the this entity that was in the burning bush is an angel. 
is not Yahweh himself, but it's an angel or a messenger of Yahweh, right? So I, I believe this is very clear, but when you continue to read on, you'll, you'll see that, you know, Moses, he has an encounter with this angel that's speaking to him. And, um, you know, the angel, it, it, uh, it gives the title, I am that I am. Right. Or, and, and really it's like, if you, uh, j like jump into the Hebrew and, and do like a deep dive, which I'm not jumping in and doing right now, but it actually translates to, it translates to, I will be what I will be. Right. And, um, and there's a good book. It's called, um, understanding the divine name, um, in Exodus. And it really chronicles and, and details this whole thing, but I, I don't want to, um, deter from the topic right but first off we see that you know the most high wasn't speaking in the bush so that's one and secondly the topic in question within within this conversation is abraham so why would this be a reference to an encounter with moses you know that's 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 a a, a bit you know that's a bit of an uh, you know, unintelligible reference, but you know what's actually being referenced here is the Messiah's prior existence. You know, to Abraham, right? And as you know, as the brother Hurt went into, you know, a few weeks ago when um he had his lesson about the uh, what was it the the Aryan controversy, right? Uh -huh. You know, it it actually um it was a beautiful lesson, and the brother he showed how. The Messiah, he does have an origin, but it's from a long time ago, right? That's in Micah 5, but let's, let's actually pull that up, and we're going to read it in the YLT. Ah. God. Um, should I be pulling it up? Let me see. All right, right here. God. And thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, little to be among the chiefs of judah from thee to me he cometh forth to be ruler in israel and his comings forth are of old from the days of antiquity mm. so right here when you read in michael 5 um it's actually detailing um a messianic figure right or the messianic figure you know that would come out of bethlehem which would you know of course end up being yahushua you know, and it says that he was from the days of antiquity, right? And when you look at the word antiquity, it means, you know, ancient days or, you know, distant time, right? So this is saying that he, he's from a very long time ago, you know, like way before Abraham, right? So when the Messiah says before Abraham, for Abraham was, I am, that's him speaking to the fact that he existed, you know, before Abraham or anybody existed, you know? He existed when or he came into existence when the father brought him forth right but um you, you have anything you want to add on before i move on nah that's a good point i good uh scripture to bring i i actually was thinking about it when we read <laughs> when we read that script i was like yeah this is a good scripture to bring this out to show his origin yeah of course he has an origin that predates abraham so, you know he was very correct about what he was saying, but they just took it to mean mean it the way that they they took it, you know. Like, oh man, you're not you're not even uh 50 years old, man. You tripping talking about you was here before Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and you you know that's how Jake D, man, they just they want to scoff and 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 um and just just make you wrong. You get what I'm saying, but God. and if they would have understood who he was, that he was the Messiah, the promised Messiah. They would have understood what he was talking about. Con, absolutely. Con, and and that's a that's a great point because, man, that, and that that's a beautiful lesson in and of itself because you'll you'll read, um, like obviously you, you see it in like the birth story of the Messiah, that he was born in Bethlehem, right, and he he was there until he was about two years old, and then he was forced to you know his family was forced to flee. You know because of the persecution from Herod, right when he, he you know you read that in matthew 2 he starts to kill all all of the children that are two years old and younger 
right? But, you know, when he came back, you know, from Egypt, you know, like they went and, you know, they, they stayed back in, uh, in, in Galilee, right, in Nazareth. But you see people in the gospel saying, hey, what prophet was supposed to come out of Galilee? So, like, they're, they're finding little things to nitpick, you know, about Yahawashah because it's not, um, you know, he, he didn't come forth in the way that they perceived, right? And, and we, we constantly were, were seeing that, you know, th you know, throughout the Gospels, you know, they're trying to, you know, put them against some type of litmus test. But, you know, like you see that their understanding is just off and that, you know, they a lot of them just couldn't get it. Right. But you had, you know, that faithful remnant, you know, that they were able to understand, you know, the Apostle Peter, you know, and the and the arrest and the rest of the disciples. Right. But um, but definitely a beautiful point. Time and uh, I, you can you can um, you can pull a precept in Hebrews two. Okay. And um, we'll start at verse eight. Okay. It's the book of Hebrews, chapter two, verse eight. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Con and read verse 9 also. Con, verse 9. But we see Yahweh Shai, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Con, con. So this place that he had before antiquity, he actually, you know, forfeited that, that place to become a little lower than the angels just to fulfill a mission that the most high God put them on. So mm -hmm. this also is something that, you know, they would have known, they would have known who he was because scripture already foretold of this certain man coming that was going to have to take this in this, uh, this position that was going to be lower than the position that he was already placed in, in the heaven. God, God. And, that, and that's even detailed in, um, Isaiah 53 and 6. Well, Isaiah 53 is in totality and a few different places as well. So that's a beautiful point. Kind. Kind, but um but yeah, you know, you know, I uh you know we, we can you know kind of conclude this right and, and Lord willing, you know, this uh you know this lesson or this presentation that was helpful with clearing up confusion for, for different passages that get used inappropriately, you know, to try to prove that Yahweh Shai or, or Jesus is the father, you know, or, or even the most high. Right. Um, and so what I'll be doing is I'll just, I'll wrap up, you know, with a few passages, you know, out of Yahweh Shai's mouth, red letter that proved that, um, or, or at least within the gospels, you know, that proved that Yahweh Shai has a father and that he's not the father right let's start with the book of mark chapter 14 verse 35 through 36. Time. this is mark chapter 14 verse 35 and 36 and he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible the hour might pass from him and he said abba father all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Mm. So, first we see the Messiah praying to the Father, and he calls him Father. Matter of fact, he calls him Father twice. He says, Abba, Father. All right, so he said Father twice. But we see that he's asking his Father to take away the cup from him. And, and of course, this is in regards to his suffering that he was going to have to do. But the point right here in this passage is that he had to pray to his father. So, and, and also he had to ask of his father if a cup could be taken from him. So, 
again, these are about three proofs that the Messiah is not the, you know, the father in about two verses. You know, it, it showed that he prayed to the father. He called the father his father. And then he he also uh he, he asked him for matter of fact he had he had a he had his own uh what, what, what do you what do you call it um he he had his had his request he wanted the cup to pass him if it was possible right okay. you know but he had to you know be obedient unto death as we as we read in Philippians you know but again this is another clean proof that he's not the father but He's the son of the father and subordinate to him, right? Let's jump to another one. Let's go to the book of John, chapter 16, verse 27 on down to 28. God, this is John 16, verse 27 and 28. For the father himself loveth you because ye have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the father. And am coming to the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is the Messiah cleanly saying, "He came from the Father," and this is another proof that He isn't the Father Himself. You know, He literally said, "You know, I came forth from the Father, and I'm leaving the world to go to the Father." So. I believe this one is plain upon tables and self-explanatory, right? And if anybody that says that Yahweh Shah's the father tries to argue and somehow try to flip this and make it say or make it say something else, then you know maybe you shouldn't, you know, continuously dialogue with them, but just just pray for that person, right? But um, let's go to the last one. Let's go to John. Chapter 20 and verse 17. God, uh, this is John chapter 20, verse 17. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Mm. Hmm. So, so right here. You see that Yahweh Shai, um, conceptually speaking, he's a uh, he's speaking to Mary Magdalene, and he tells her that he's going to ascend to his father and his God, which is the same father and God as his brethren, right? So, you know, I'm I'm not gonna try to add too much to this text because it literally says what it says, so. With that being said, you know, um, you know, Lord's will, you know, I hope that the point was hammered home and made more clear that Yahweh Shai or Jesus Christ, as many call him, is not God the Father, but he's the son of God the Father. And with that, I give all praises, honor and glory to the Most High in the name of his son, Yahweh Shai, and I'll you. Ah. And all praise is beautiful. Listen, I all praise. Just want to say uh the water to everybody tuned in, everybody that liked and shared the video. And if you're watching the replay, we ask that you please do the same thing and um make sure you share this with somebody that may be actually interested in the deity of Christ and wanting to get a breakdown or a better understanding on this uh title or this topic. And um with that, you know, uh, brother, you can take us on out of here. Con, con. Um, kind of at the water for the reading as well. Con, for sure, for sure. Con. Um, we'll close it out with number six and 24. Yahweh will bless thee and keep thee. Yahweh will make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. Yahweh will lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. And with that, I'll say Shalom. Shalom, Mark. Shalom, fam.
Can't tell me nothing by life if you don't know pain How you gon' try to coach if you don't know the game You gon' get on the field and pick the wrong place Instead of seeking help, you wanna do your own thing A little bit is the love of me, love That's why I'm giving you all of my love, girl Thought I knew love, but you redefined it Redefined it. Took me a while, but indeed I found it Finally found it Kisses and hugs, keeping me reminded Fake love in the past had me blinded So you can't cancel me, cause I don't Fame. I just want to wake up my people and break the You just want to do what you feel, yeah, yeah. Because you're living in the love state. The fear of God is knowledge, but fools despise instruction. They need a Bible college for wisdom. The Holy Spirit instructs me. Sucklers need milk, they can't digest. They can't meet just to learn, so they misinterpret John 316. Saying Christ died for all, but everybody don't need saving. Deliverance is the essence of our eternal salvation.